thank you very much for having me today. Uh, today, I'm going to speak to you about aligning your stakeholders and customers with your data and strategies. Now, this is a topic that's, of course, of, of interest to a lot of people these days as data becomes more central to organizational strategy. A little bit about me first. I'm a Paul Eater. I am a lead consultant at the Center for Organizational Excellence. Uh, for over 16 years, I've been helping organizations in both the public and the private sector improve their efficiency, effectiveness, and their stakeholder engagement. I've had a lot of peer-reviewed and government-focused articles, as well as uh, published a book called Firestarters, How Innovators, Instigators, and Initiators Can Inspire You to Ignite Your Own Life. Over the course of my career, I've worked with a number of government agencies, ranging from Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Veterans Affairs, as well as many public sector organizations and private sector organizations. Today's agenda, I'm gonna go through three different models of how stakeholders can be united behind your data. Those models focus on models that I've applied as part of my organization, models that are typical in the consulting sphere, such as the four level model, as well as a model that I present and discuss in my own book called the socially balanced strategy. First, there's gonna be a maturity model perspective. We're gonna be talking about what I refer to as stakeholder acumen. Acumen really refers to how someone presents themselves to others and how others interpret their actions and behaviors. When we're talking about stakeholder acumen, there are five different levels that I will, I will refer to, ranging from transactional, to supportive, to committed, to strategic, and transformational. Acumen is your ability to respond to the requirements of a job or project in what might be the appropriate way. Now, what is appropriate in one circumstance might not be appropriate in another. Some circumstances require more compliance orientation, just getting the job done, getting the numbers out, getting the information out. Other jobs require a more transformational perspective, such as looking five years out, being more visionary, thinking about what things are going to look like, even if they don't look that way now. Now, naturally, a lot of stakeholders tend to uh, consolidate themselves and their behaviors around one of these perspectives versus others. For example, some, uh, some stakeholders tend to be, have that more transactional bent focusing on that compliance orientation, and others tend to be, um, find themselves more in that uh, area where they're looking out multiple years and seeing what the world is gonna look like that it doesn't look like now. Now, as a consultant, especially a consultant dealing with data issues, one of the things that you constantly have to do is take a look at where your client or your customer is and figure out how you can adapt your own perspective to meet them where they are and help guide them where they need to be. So one of the uh, key tenets here is that you can't change the stakeholder, but you can orient yourself towards them and work with them to help achieve something successful. So what do transactional stakeholders look like? Well, as we uh, started discussing, transactional uh, stakeholders focus a lot on day-to-day -day activity. That doing what you need to do to be compliant within the day is what you equate with results. So how do you support someone with this kind of orientation? Well, one of the things you wanna do is make sure they understand what you're doing and how you're helping them achieve those daily activities and accomplish those daily activities. Sometimes there needs to be a focus more on the day-to-day -day output than on the multi-year outcomes that you're working towards. You wanna be concrete, simple, and clear, and always make sure that um, you're on the same page in terms of not trying to you know, cloud them with what they may seem as unnecessary five year from now details when they're just trying to get through the day. One of the things you might have to do is take charge of that larger mission without explicitly saying that that's what's happening because that's going to be something that distracts them from their day-to-day -day activities. The next uh, level of acumen is what we call supportive stakeholders. Supportive stakeholders um, definitely want others to maybe work a little bit beyond that compliance orientation. However, there is a, a fear among supportive stakeholders of getting out too far. Okay? 
one of the things you might want to do is, is make sure that um, they understand they have the ability to generate ideas and new ideas to address uh, the situation. And when they do take that first step to initiate a new idea or a new course of action, be very supportive of them in that action. So the way to support supportive stakeholders is to be supportive of them when they're stepping out of that compliance orientation. Um, one of the things that is it's helpful in a supportive environment and maybe a little more difficult in the COVID-19 environment is to be as be present with them as possible. Sometimes even that physical presence can be viewed as supportive. I guess in this COVID telework world, being present might be more of uh, ensuring that you have ongoing teleconferences with them where they can see you and see that you're supporting them in the way that they need to be supportive of others. Moving on to committed stakeholders, um, people with a committed level of acumen tend to be a lot more open to new possibilities. They see value in being strategic and devoting their resources to those strategies. Um, however, they may not be um, as in tune with exactly what those outcomes that are trying to be achieved are. And so one of the things that you have to do to help them, especially in data initiatives, to get them to learn and grow is share some articles with them, hold many learning sessions. Committed stakeholders want to learn and want to grow beyond where they are. They just don't quite know how to do that. And so your job uh, is to get them on board with the data you're trying to present and help them help to educate them to make them feel comfortable with that. Um, they have to be able to see that whole process, understand what you're trying to lead them to, and not just what you're leading them to, but why you're leading them there. And once you provide that whole story, you're more likely to get some movement beyond just that day-to-day -day compliance orientation. The next level of acumen is strategic stakeholders. Strategic stakeholders really want to be involved in strategic, strategic initiatives with more long-term results orientation. Um, they desire to have measurement systems in place with, um, in some cases, more complicated data analytics that might be predictive in nature. They're open to change and they want to talk about that what if. If we, if we do this, what's going to happen? Is there any data to support that? Uh, now, the, the, the problem with strategic stakeholders is that sometimes they lose sight of ensuring that the day-to-day -day compliance activities that have to happen do happen on the way to being more strategic. And so sometimes you have to, to ground them to ensure that they're not losing sight of those strategic act, uh, those uh, transactional activities. Um, strategic stakeholders are open to uh, uh, someone who is a consulting partner being a mutual partner in that relationship. They want to challenge you and, and they expect you to challenge them back. So if the data isn't saying what you expect or isn't saying what they expect, expect to hear questions from them and they also expect you to have answers or questions for them if they're also presenting data back that doesn't make sense. So it's a really give and take relationship with strategic stakeholders. And finally, as you get to the more transformational level of acumen, transformational stakeholders, uh, these are people who are often thinking multiple years ahead, uh, going through multiple what if scenarios in their head, thinking about the possibilities. They want to align what they're doing in their business with that overall strategy, strategy that's going to take them where they are multiple years from now. Um, they want to partner with as many other people as possible or as required to achieve the results that they see as possible. Um, one of the problems that they'll run into is a lot of times that they have a lot more ideas than they do data. And a lot of times the directions they, they see the world heading, they see the organization heading, don't necessarily have data systems in place to support them. So your job as a consultant and as a, a data professional is to help them uh, establish those measurement systems when possible, or help define what measurement would look like um, that would uh, trigger the necessary targets and, uh, and uh, give the information required to ensure that getting to that point five years from now is happening, is making progress, is meeting the necessary milestones uh, that are need needed to get there. Now, one thing with transformational leaders and, and transformational stakeholders to think about is that sometimes they think about that broad future without necessarily thinking about the, the obstacles or the cons of trying to go in a particular direction. So one of your job is to use data if possible, but to point out both the pros and cons of moving in different directions. You know, what is the return on investment if you go in this direction versus another direction? And not just assume that because 
you know, they have all these great ideas that every one of those uh, ideas is going to lead them exactly where they think it's going to go. Um, so you have to be challenging in a way that's supportive of their ideas, but also presents data to support the fact that maybe there's an alternative direction that's better. So that, that's uh, an acumen level perspective. Next, I want to take you through a measurement level perspective that we call return on expectation. And this is based on a common model used in consulting of all different types called a four level model. Now, first of all, return on expectation is an intentional term, ROE. A lot of times you'll see in, in literature and in discussions and just management boardrooms, the use of the term return on investment or ROI, which often refers to a specific measure or specific monetary goal that someone might have, uh, as the result of an initiative. Return on expectation is a little bit different and is sometimes even more relevant in the public sector where results are not often measured based on uh, the amount of money or monetary return, but rather on is the program achieving what the intent was behind it. So ROAE refers to whether a program is delivering upon the results that you expect. And those results might not necessarily be monetary or, or numerical in nature. Now, the difficulty with ROE is that people at different levels in the organization, from executive to line manager to training or HR manner, manager and, and line worker, that might have different expectations for a program. So the key there is to get out in front uh, with the appropriate communications management to ensure as much as possible that all stakeholders involved in a program understand what the key expectations and results that are expected from a program are. So before I referenced the four levels of evaluation or, or a four level model, a lot of times in, in different uh, uh, segments of consulting, you might see this referred to as a Kirkpatrick model. Essentially, what a four-level model does is it allows you to tell a story about what you're trying to achieve through your program. And this story is communicated through various data points. Um, at level one, you're looking at data pertaining to reactions and attitude. How do people think or feel about a particular program and its intent? At level two, you're looking at data about people's knowledge of a program. Do people know what their roles are? Do people have the necessary prerequisite knowledge to act in a way that's necessary for this program to be successful? At level three, you're thinking about data that relates to behaviors. So if, you know, if everyone is satisfied with the program, if everyone is knowledgeable about the program, are they also behaving consistently with what you would expect if you were working towards program success? So what are the measures of behavior that you can put in place? Is it supervisory evaluations? Is it some kind of process checks that are just built into uh, an automated data collection tool? Uh, are there any obstacles that can be identified for effective action? And are those being effectively measured to see if the, that's yielding any um, red flags that have to be noted to ensure that the proper behaviors can be in place? And finally, when you get to level four, uh, you're talking about the results that a particular organization is trying to achieve. Um, are those results consistent with the expectations that were established at the onset of the program? So what you can see is that together, these four levels tell a complete story about what's going on in your program. And all four of these levels are dependent to, to a certain extent on data. You know, does the data support that people have the attitudes, knowledge, behavior, and results necessary to achieve the expectations of the program? If the data is off at any of those level, that gives you, uh, at any of those levels, that gives you some understanding of where the root cause is of any issues you're having and seeing the results. For example, if you aren't achieving the results you want and you go back and look at your measures and you see that people aren't behaving in a way that's consistent with achieving the results, well, you have some, um, some level of information to know that interventions regarding uh, making sure that people are behaving pro uh, properly are in place. Conversely, let's say you have an organization that actually is achieving the results you want, but people don't like it, they don't know what their role is, and they aren't acting the right way. 
is that program a success? Well, from a pure results standpoint, if those are the only measures that matter to you, you might say yes. But from a complete data story standpoint, you might say that those results are only being achieved by chance and not by uh, anything conscious that you're doing as an organization because your people aren't acting the right, right way. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing and the, they, they dislike the program. So something else is yielding those results uh, rather than something rather than intentionality. And that allows you as a program owner to also make certain decisions about what kind of interventions you need to put in with your staff. Good results don't necessarily make a good program. There are multiple different ways that you could assess data and assess and collect data at each of the four levels. This chart here is just an example of some of the types of things you might want to look at. Some types of measurements such as interviews or uh, surveys might be good data collection uh, mechanisms for all four levels of analysis. And you can structure questions um, to ensure that you're collecting data against all four levels. Other um, assessment methods such as simulation um, might be more relevant to something like behavior. Are people acting the way they should in a simulated environment? Um, so again, um, this is just an example and there may be, you know, one-off examples where maybe some of these methods uh, would be good for a level that isn't even checked here. But for the most part, this gives some grounding into the fact that yes, there are multiple data collection methods, but not all of them would necessarily be relevant to every uh, level of analysis. And when you're working with your stakeholders, you want to make sure that you communicate that. So if someone proposes, you know, a survey, you want to make sure that that survey includes questions that correctly address the level of analysis that you're most concerned with, or even all levels of analysis if you're concerned with all of them. So that was uh, a view of how to frame your data to make sure that it's measuring a program uh, based on the intent of that program. Um, the, uh, the final way that I'm going to um, discuss presenting data to stakeholders is what I call a social, socially balanced approach. And a socially balanced approach takes into account the unique perspective of all people, but the stakeholders specifically, and how that uh, perspective of that stakeholder might actually bias the type of data that they're likely to look at and care about when assessing a situation. I'll give you an example. Let's say that an organization uh, called Feed the Hungry Inc. is formed with a tagline of we solve world hunger. And this organization is all about going around the world, making sure that uh, everyone who needs food has food. Sounds like a great organization, right? Well, then we take a look at what their strategic plan is. See, the organization's mission, provide food for the needy. The strategy, well, we're going to work with authoritarian governments to seize the, seize the means of production, the top agricultural producers, and then distribute those food products to needy countries. Uh, we also have a vision of becoming the number one uh, supplier of food for the hungry in the world. And one of our strategies will be to retain the food supply industry's best employees by providing posh accommodations around the world so that our employees experience luxury while traveling. Now, these strategies may be consistent with that mission and vision, but there might be something about them that's a little bit off. I'm sure you're seeing that, and as you're hearing these, you might say, well, that might result in the hungry being fed, but it might result in some inconsistency in the way in which that organization might be perceived by potential stakeholders. Well, why is that? Well, the organization is not culturally transparent um, and in a way that would make both employees and uh, other perceivers of the organization feel good, okay? Cultural transparency to stakeholders uh, is very important for ensuring an organization is sustainable. Culturally transparent organizations or more sustainable than those that only have good intentions. So how does an organization build its cultural transparency? Well, it's an interaction of two elements, the stated motivation and the social actions of the organization. What does your organization say and wants to do? And what does your organization actually do? 
So an organization like Feed the Hungry, that seems like a charitable organization, might be have an inconsistency in perception when it starts working with authoritarian governments. Okay, those two things seem potentially at odds with each other. One way to think about this is through something called the social wheel. In social psychology, uh, where I got my degree, the, there is something called social value orientation. And social value orientation has to do with an interaction of, of how you view helping yourself and helping others in terms of rationality. Um, when applied to the organization, an organization may have a social value orientation of focusing on its internal strength or on focus on helping uh, external uh, entities. So there, there could be uh, two different axes here, focusing on your organizational strengths and weaknesses versus helping or disrupting stakeholders. And those interactions form interesting ways in which an organization can be perceived by others. Now, one of the orientations you can have is something called altruism. This is where there is a strong focus on helping stakeholders and a weaker focus on, on, on organizational strengths. And that focus on altruism can be both internal or external in an organization. Internal altruism would be maybe an organization that sponsors programs to improve the well-being of its employees. External altruism could be an organization that sponsors programs to improve the well-being of the community in some way. And both of those are altruistic activities, but the focus is both internal or, or external. An organization could also have a cooperative orientation, social value orientation. So internally, groups within the organization could effectively partner for the organization's success, or externally, an organization as a whole can form strategic partners with other organizations to aid in achieving the organization's mission. So again, both of those activities could be cooperative, but the focus is either internal or external. The third orientation is individualism. Organizations could focus on making the best use of their own human and intellectual capital. That would be an internal focus. Or there could be an external focus where an organization effectively exploits technological innovations, products, and ideas of other organizations. For example, if your organization becomes you know, the sole licensed provider of someone else's technology, and that's not a technology that your organization produced, but you, produced, uh, but you were able to exploit that relationship uh, for your organization's success. There's also a competitive orientation. Organizations may instill healthy competitions between their own employees and internal teams to yield benefits, but they also could focus on competitors externally and be competitive in a way they outperform their competitors on key measures, um, such as customer service, or you know, if it comes to the, the you know, private sector, maybe, maybe a stock price, things like that. Finally, there is a kind of a disturbance and aggressive orientation. For a disturbance and aggressive orientation, an organization uh, uh, internally may focus on its internal processes and structure in removing any obstacles and removing bad processes to put in place new ones. Externally, an organization might try to exhibit what they call thought leadership and implement innovative programs that make ripples throughout their industry. So it's an aggressive orientation that looks to change things. Now, I, I, one organization I went into, it was an educational organization. I did an assessment ahead of time for the, uh, the board of directors and helped them understand where their strategies were from a, from a transparency standpoint. Um, one of the hallmarks of this socially balanced strategy is that each of these orientations could be important to your organizational success. And focusing internally and externally, each could also be important for your organization's success. So I worked with the board of directors to do a survey assessment as to how well the organization's strategy tapped each of these dimensions of social value orientation. Uh, the green areas are the areas where across the board, the board of directors saw strengths in terms of the transparency, both you know, internally and externally. And the yellow areas were, there was, there was some inconsistency in the way the board of directors viewed it. And the red areas 
were the areas of weakness identified by the board of directors. So in this particular organization, uh, what you can see is that the, the, they weren't focusing on cooperating with external entities. They weren't focused on uh, finding ways to leverage the strengths of any other uh, external organizations. And they weren't properly focusing on uh, how to best compete in their industry. Okay. And when I focused on not just how they view their organization, but the orientation of the board of directors themselves, an interesting pattern emerged. Um, so there are uh, probably, you know, about 12 or so members of the board of directors. And looking at that social wheel that we talked about earlier, we tried to focus on where their own personal orientation fell on that wheel. Now, on this, uh, on this particular diagram, just know if you look towards the top of the wheel, that focuses on a more altruistic uh, personal orientation. If you look towards the right-hand side, that's more of an individualist orientation. And if you look at the bottom, that's more of an aggressive orientation. Um, if you, the mixture in between the, uh, the top and the right, that would be cooperative. In between the bottom and the right, that would be uh, a competitive orientation. Now, there seems to be two clusters in this organization. One cluster that tends to be more altruistic. Uh, so in an educational or, uh, organization, that's not surprising. There are people who just want to go out and help students learn more. Uh, and then there's a cluster towards the bottom that's more of that aggressive and disruptive orientation. These are people who just want to do things differently in their industry or differently than what they're doing now. Now, what tended to be missing among the board of directors was anyone with a really strong cooperative, individualistic, or competitive orientation. Now, take that, and let's go back and take a look at the prior slide. You now see that there is a pattern here. The board of directors itself lacked cooperative, individualist, and competitive orientations, and their strategy lacked cooperative, individualist, and competitive orientations as well, especially when, when referencing uh, how they could be externally cooperative, individualistic, and competitive. Um, so by presenting uh, that fact to the organization, they were able to restructure their strategy to make sure that their own cultural blind spots were actually represented, and they found ways to be more uh, competitive, uh, found ways to make sure that they were looking at innovations going on in the industry and being able to exploit those for their best purposes as well. So one of the keys of the socially balanced approach is using data to show where your organizational uh, blind spots are, where you aren't being culturally transparent to your stakeholders. Um, so the building blocks of cultural transparency are the individual orientations, okay? which may impact the organization's approach as we just saw. What the organization's approach okay, is, so the, the, in how the organization approaches the world may make different stakeholders feel included or not. For example, if you as an organization have strategies all focused on altruism, but all of your stakeholders are competitive, they may feel lost and not see themselves in what the organization is doing. Just like we talked about feed the hungry, you probably have a lot of altruistic people who are really into feed the hungry. But when they see the strategies are all aggressive and disruptive, that may be a disconnect for them and why there's limited cultural transparency and it may lead to less organizational success. So you have the individual orientations, you have the organizational approach, as well as how you describe that organizational approach. And that's all together, those interact to affect transparency. So even if you have the right organizational approach, if you describe it incorrectly, stakeholders still might not see themselves in it. So to summarize, uh, we've gone through three different methods of how, how uh, your stakeholders could be aligned with your data and strategies, and also how you can use data to help, help with that alignment of your stakeholders. Hope you've enjoyed this talk. And if you have, then uh, definitely feel free to take a look at the upcoming presentations at the Government Performance Summit. Um, I'll also be speaking there for, the, for both the, my organization, the Center for Organizational Excellence, and uh, the, the uh, Performance Institute will be sponsoring that uh, summit. And I look forward to seeing anyone there.
thank you for your time. And, and you can see my contact information below if you have any questions or want to reach out regarding anything in this presentation. Appreciate it.